Hello, my name is Sin Bagley, and I am reading Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. This is a book from Project Gutenberg, and I am reading Chapter 9, Queen Alice. Well, this is grand, said Alice. I never expected I should be a queen so soon. And I'll tell you what it is, Your Majesty, she went on in a severe tone. She was always rather fond of scolding herself. It'll never do for you to be lolling about in the grass like that. Queens have to be dignified, you know. So she got up and walked about rather stiffly just at first, as she was afraid that the crown might come off. But she comforted herself with the thought that there was nobody to see her. And if I really am a queen, she said, as she sat down again, I shall be able to manage it quite well in time. Everything was happening so oddly that she didn't feel a bit surprised at finding the Red Queen and the White Queen sitting close to her, on one on each side. She would have liked very much to ask them how they came there, but she feared it would not be quite civil. However, there would be no harm, she thought, in asking if the game was over. Please, would you tell me, she began, looking timidly at the Red Queen, Speak when you're spoken to, the queen sharply interrupted her. But if everybody obeyed that rule, said Alice, who was always ready for a little argument, and if you only spoke when you were spoken to, and the person was always waited for you to begin, you could see nobody would ever say anything, so that... Ridiculous, cried the queen. Why don't you see, child? Here she broke off with a frown, and after thinking for a minute, suddenly changed the subject of the conversation. What do you mean by if you really are a queen? And what right have you to call yourself so? You can't be a queen, you know, till you've passed the proper examination. And the sooner we begin it, the better. I only said if, poor Alice pleaded in a piteous tone. The two queens looked at each other, and, and the red queen remarked with a little shudder. She says she only said if. But she said a great deal more than that, the queen, white queen moaned, wringing her hands. Oh, ever so much more than that. So you did, you know, the red queen said to Alice. Always speak the truth. Think before you speak and write it down backwards. I'm sure I didn't mean, Alice was beginning, but the red queen interrupted her impatiently. That's just what I complain of. You should have meant. What do you suppose is the use of child without any meaning? Even a joke should have some meaning, and a child's more important than a joke, I hope. You couldn't deny that, even if you tried with both hands. I don't deny things with my hands, Alice objected. Nobody said you did, said the Red Queen. I said you couldn't if you tried. She's in that state of mind, said the right White Queen, that she wants to deny something, only she doesn't know what to deny. A nasty, vicious temper, the Red Queen remarked, and then there was an uncomfortable silence for a minute or two. The Red Queen broke the silence by saying to the White Queen, I invite you to Alice's dinner party this afternoon. The, Red, the White Queen smiled feebly and said, And I invite you. I didn't know there was to be a party at all, said Alice, but if there is to be one, I think I ought to invite the guests. We gave you the opportunity of doing it, the Red Queen remarked, but I dare say you've not had many lessons in manners yet. Manners are not taught in lessons, said Alice. Lessons teach you to do sums and things of that sort. And you do addition? The White Queen asked. What's one and 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 one? I don't know, said Alice. I lost count. She can't do addition, the Queen interrupted. Red Queen interrupted. Can you do subtraction? Take nine from eight. Nine from eight. I can't, you know, Alice replied very rarely. But she can't do subtraction, said the Red Queen. Can you do division? Divide a loaf by a knife. What's the answer to that? I suppose Alice was beginning, but the Red Queen answered for her. Bread and butter, of course. Try another subtraction some. Take a bone from a dog. What remains? Alice considered. The bone wouldn't remain, of course, if I took it, and the dog wouldn't remain. It would come to bite me, and I'm sure I wouldn't remain. Then you think nothing would remain, said the Red Queen? I think that's the answer. Wrong, as usual, said the Red Queen. The dog's temper would remain. But I don't see how. Why, look here, the Red Queen cried. The dog would lose its temper, wouldn't it? Perhaps it would, replied. Alice replied cautiously. Then if the dog went away, its temper would remain, the Queen exclaimed triumphantly. Alice said as quite gravely as she could that they might go different ways, 
but she couldn't help thinking to herself, what a dreadful nonsense we are talking. She can do sums a bit, the queen said together with great emphasis. Can you do sums, Elsa said, turning suddenly on the white queen, for she didn't like being found fault with so much. The queen gasped her eyes and sh- the queen gasped and shut her eyes. I can do addition if you give me time, but I can't do subtraction under any circumstance. Of course, you know your ABC," said the Red Queen. "To be sure, I do," said Alice. "So do I," the Queen White Queen whispered. "Well, often say it over together, dear, and I'll tell you a secret, and I can read words of one letter. Isn't that grand? However, don't be discouraged; you'll come to it in time." Here the Red Queen began again. Can you answer a useful question? She said. How is bread made? I know that, Alice cried eagerly. You take some flour. Where do you pick the flour? The Queen, White Queen asked. In a garden or in hedges? Well, it isn't picked at all, Alice explained. It's ground. How many acres of ground? Said the White Queen. You mustn't leave out so many things. Fan her head, the Red Queen anxiously interrupted. She'll be feverish after so much thinking. So they set to work and fanned her with bunches of leaves till she had to beg them to leave off. It blew her hair about so. She's all right now, said the Red Queen. Do you know languages? What's the French for fiddle-dee-dee? Fiddle-dee-dee's not English, Alice replied gravely. Whoever said it was, said the Queen. Alice thought she saw a way out of this difficulty this time. If you'll tell me what language fiddle-dee-dee is, I'll tell you the French for it, she exclaimed triumphantly. But the Red Queen drew herself up stiffly and said, Queens never make bargains. I wish queens never asked questions, Alice thought to herself. Don't let us quarrel, the Red White Queen, queen said in an anxious tone. What is the cause of lightning? The cause of lightning, Alice said very decidedly, for she felt quite certain about this is a thunder. No, no, she hastily corrected herself. I meant the other way. It's too late to correct it, said the Red Queen. When you've once said a thing that fixes it, you must take the consequences. Which reminds me, the White Queen said, looking down nervously and clasping and unclasping her hands. We had such a thunderstorm last Tuesday. I mean, one of the last set of Tuesdays, you know. Alice was puzzled. In our country, she remarked, there was only one day at a time. The Red Queen said, That's a poor, thin way of doing things. Now here we mostly have days and nights, two or three at a time, and sometimes in the winter we take as many as five nights together, for warmth, you know. Are five nights warmer than one night then? Alice ventured to ask. Five times as warm, of course. But they couldn't be, but they should be five times as cold by the same rule. Just so, cried the Red Queen, five times as warm and five times as cold, just as I am five times as rich as you are and five times as clever. Alice sighed and gave up. It's exactly like a riddle with no answer, she thought. Humpty Dumpty thought, too, the White Queen went on in a low voice, more as if she were talking to herself. He came to the door with a corkscrew in his hand. What did he want? said the Red Queen. He said he would come in, the White Queen went on, because he was looking for a hippopotamus. Now, as it happened, there wasn't such a thing in the house that morning. Is there generally? Alice asked in an astonished tone. Well, only on Thursday, said the Queen. I know what he came for, said Alice. He wanted to punish the fish because... Here the White Queen began again. It's such a thunderstorm you can't think. She never could, you know, said the Red Queen. And part of the roof came off, and ever so much thunder got in, and it went rolling around the room in great lumps, and knocking over the tables and things, till I was so frightened I couldn't remember my own name. Alice thought to herself, I never should try to remember my name in the middle of an accident, or what would be the use of it? But she did not say this aloud for fear of hurting the poor queen's feeling. Your Majesty must excuse her, the Red Queen said to Alice, taking one of the red, White Queen's hands in her own and gently stroking it. She means well, but she can't help saying foolish things as a general rule. The White Queen looked timidly at Alice, who felt she ought to say something kind, but really couldn't think of anything at the moment. She never was really br- well brought up, the Red Queen went on. But it's amazing how good tempered she is. Pat her on the head and see how pleased she'll be. But this was more than Alice had courage to do. 
a little kindness and putting her hair in papers would do wonders with her. The white queen gave a deep sigh and laid her head on Alice's shoulder. I am so sleepy, she moaned. She's tired, poor thing, said the red queen to smooth her hair. Lend her your nightcap and sing her a soothing lullaby. I haven't got a nightcap with me, said Alice as she tried to obey the first direction, and I don't know any soothing lullabies. I must do it myself then, said the red queen, and she began. Hush your bye in Alice's lap. Till the feast's ready, we'll have time for a nap. When the feast's over, we'll go to the ball. Red Queen and White Queen and Alice and all. And now you know the words, she added as she put her head down on Alice's other shoulder. Just sing through to me. I'm getting sleepy too. In another moment, both queens were asleep and snoring loudly. What am I to do? exclaimed Alice, looking about in great perplexity as first one round head, then the other rolled down from her shoulder and lay like a heavy lump in her lap. I don't think it ever happened before that they had one to take care of two queens asleep at once. No, not in all the history of England. It couldn't, you know, because there were never was more than one queen at a time. Do we yet wake up, you heavy things? She went on in an impatient tone, but there was no answer but a gentle snoring. The snoring got more distinct every minute and sounded more like a tune, and at last she could even make out the words as she listened so eagerly that when the two great heads vanished from her lap, she hardly missed them. She was standing before an arched doorway over which were the words Queen Alice in large letters, and on each side of the arch there was a bell handle. One was marked Visitor's Bell and the other Servant's Bell. I'll wait till the song's over, thought Alice, and then I'll ring. Which bell must I ring? She went on very much puzzled by the names. I'm not a visitor and I'm not a servant. There ought to be one marked queen, you know. And then the door opened a little way and this creature with a long beak put his head out for a moment and said, No admittance till the week after next. And shut the door with a bang. Alice knocked and rang in vain for a long time, but at last a very old frog who was sitting under a tree got up and hobbled, hobbled slowly towards her. He was breast and dressed in bright yellow and had enormous boots on. What is it now? the frog said in a deep hoarse whisper. Alice turned around ready to find fault with anybody. Where's the servant whose business it is to answer the door? she began angrily. Which door? said the frog. Alice almost stamped with irritation at the slow drawl in which he spoke. This door, of course. The frog looked at the door with his large dull eyes for a minute. Then he went near and rubbed it with his thumb as if he were trying whether the paint would come off. Then he looked at Alice. To answer the door, was it, what's it been asking of? He was so hoarse that Alice could scarcely hear him. I don't know what you mean, she said. I talks English, doesn't I? The frog went on. Or are you deaf? What did I ask you? Nothing, Alice said impatiently. I've been knocking at it. Shouldn't do that, shouldn't do that, the frog muttered, vexes it, you know. Then he went over and gave the door a kick with his great feet. You let it alone, he panted as he hobbled back to the street, and I'll let you alone, you know. At this moment, the door was flung open, a shrill voice was heard singing. To the looking-glass world, it was Alice that said, I have a scepter in hand, I have a crown on my head. Let the looking-glass creatures, whatever they be, come and dine with the red queen and the white queen, and me and hundreds of voices joined in the chorus. Then fill up the glasses as quick as you can and sprinkle the table with buttons and bran. Put the cats in the coffee and mice in the tea and welcome Queen Alice with 30 times 3. Then followed a confused nose, noise of cheering and Alice thought to herself, 30 times 3 makes 90. I wonder if anyone's counting. In a minute there was a silence again and the same shrill voice sang another verse. Oh, looking glass creatures, quoth Alice, draw near. Tis an honor to see me, a favor to hear. Tis a privilege high to have dinner and tea, along with the Red Queen, the White Queen, and me. Then came the chorus again. Then fill up the glasses with treacle and ink, or anything else that is pleasant to drink. Mix sand with a cider and wool with a wine, and welcome Queen Alice with ninety times nine. Ninety times nine, Alice repeated in despair. Oh, that'll make it done. I'd better go in at once. And there was dead silence the moment she appeared. Alice glanced nervously along the table. She walked up to the large hall and noticed there were about fifty guests of all kinds. Some were animals, some birds, and there were even a few flowers among them. 
I'm glad they've come without waiting to be asked, she thought. I should never have known who were the right people to invite. There were three chairs at the head of the table. The red and white queens had already taken two of them, but the middle one was empty, and Alice sat down on it, rather uncomfortable in the silence and longing for someone to speak. At last the red queen began. You missed the soup and the fish, she said. Put on the joint. And the waiter set a leg of mutton before Alice, who looked at it rather anxiously, as she had never had to carve a joint before. You look a little shy. Let me introduce you to the leg of mutton. Alice, mutton, mutton, Alice. The leg of mutton got up in the dish and made a little bow to Alice, and Alice returned the bow, not knowing whether to be frightened or amused. May I give you a slice, she asked, taking up the knife and fork and looking from queen to queen. Certainly not, the red queen said very decidedly. It is etiquette to cut anyone you've been introduced to. Remove the joint. And the waiters carried off and brought a large plum pudding in its place. I won't be introduced to the plum pudding, please, the Alice said rather hastily, or we shall get no dinner at all. May I give you some? But the Red Queen looked sulky and growled. Pudding, Alice, Alice pudding, remove the pudding. And the waiters took it away so quickly that Alice couldn't return its bow. However, she didn't see why the Red Queen should be the one to give orders, so as an experiment, she called out, Waiter, bring back the pudding. And there it was again in a moment, like a conjuring trick. It was so large that she couldn't help feeling a little shy with it, as she had been with the mutton. However, she conquered shyness by a great effort and cut a slice and handed it to the Red Queen. What impertinence, said the pudding. I wonder how you'd like it if I were to cut a slice out of you, you creature spoke in a thick, suety sort of voice, and Alice had no word to say to reply. She could only sit and look at it and gasp. Make a remark, said the queer queen. It's ridiculous to leave all the conversation to the pudding. Do you know I've had such a quantity of poetry repeat, repeated to me today, Alice began, as a little frightened at finding that the moment she opened her lips there was dead silence, and all eyes were fixed upon her. And it's a very curious thing, I think. Every poem was about fishes in some way. Do you know why they're so fond of fishes all about here? She spoke to the Red Queen, whose answer was a little wide of the mark. As to fishes, she said very slowly and solemnly, putting her mouth close to Alice's ear, her white majesty knows a little lovely riddle, all in poetry, all about fishes. Shall she repeat it? Her Red Majesty is very kind to mention it, the White Queen murmured in Alice's other ear in a voice like a cooing of a pigeon. It would be such a treat, may I? Please do, Alice said very quietly. The White Queen laughed with delight and stroked Alice's cheek. Then she began. First the fish must be caught. That is easy. A baby, I think, could have caught it. Next the fish must be bought. That is easy. A penny, I think, would have bought it. Now cook me the fish. That is easy. Will not take more than a minute. Let it lie in a dish. That is easy because it already is in it. Bring it here, let me sup. It is easy to set such a dish on the table. Take the dish cover up. Oh, that is so hard, I fear. I am unable. For it holds it like glue. Holds the lid to the dish while it lies in the middle, which is easiest to do. Undish cover the fish or, or discover the riddle. Take a minute to think about it and then guess, said the Red Queen. Meanwhile, we'll drink your health. Queen Alice's health. She screamed at the top of her voice, and all the guests began drinking it directly, and very queerly they managed it. Some of them put their glasses upon their head like extinguishers and drank all that trickled down their faces upon. Others upset the decanters and drank the wine as it ran off the edges of the table. And three of them, who looked like kangaroos, scrambled into the dish of roast mutton and began eagerly lapping up the gravy, just like pigs in a trough, thought Alice. You ought to return thanks in a neat speech, the Red Queen said, frowning as Al at Alice as she spoke. We must support you, you know, the White Queen whispered as Alice got up to do it very obediently, but a little frightened. Thank you very much, she whispered in reply, but I can do quite well without. That wouldn't be a thing at all, the Red Queen said very decidedly, so Alice tried to submit to it with good grace. And they did push so, she said afterwards when she was telling her sister the history of the feast. You would have thought they wanted to squeeze me flat. In fact, it was rather difficult for her to keep him in her place while she made her speech. The two queens pushed her so, one on each side, that they nearly lifted her up in the air. I rise to return thanks, Alice began. She really did rise as she spoke, several inches, but she got up. 
hold of the edge of the table and managed to pull herself down again. Take care of yourself, screamed the white queen, seizing Elsa's hair with both her hands. Something's going to happen. And then, as Alice afterwards described it, all sorts of things happened in a moment. The candles all grew up to the ceiling, looking something like a bed of rushes with fireworks on top. As to the bottles, they took each they each took a pair of plates, which they hastily fitted on as wings, and so with forks for legs went fluttering about in all directions. And very like birds they look, Alice thought to herself as well as she could in the dreadful confusion that was beginning. At this moment she heard a horse laugh at her side and turned to see what was happening the matter with the white queen but instead of the queen there was a leg of mutton sitting in the chair here i am cried a voice from the soup tureen and alice turned again just in time to see the queen's broad good-natured face grinning at her for a moment over the edge of the tournament before she disappeared into the soup there was not a moment to be lost already several of the guests were lying down in the dishes and the soup ladle was walking up the table towards alice's chair and beckoning to her impatiently to get out of its way i can't stand this any longer she cried as she jumped up and seized the tablecloth with both hands one good pull and plates dishes guests and candles were crashing down together in the heap on a floor and as for you she went on turning officially upon the red queen whom she considered as the cause of all the mischief but the queen was no longer at her side, and she had suddenly doodled down to the size of a little doll, and was now on the table merrily running round and round after her own shawl, which was trailing behind her. At any other time, Alice would have felt surprised at this, but she was far too much excited to be surprised at anything now. As for you, she repeated, catching hold of the little creature in the act of jumping over a bottle which had just lighted upon the table, I'll shake you in a into a kitten. That I will. And that is the end of chapter 9.